stand and welcome to this pulpit a man that I just met today, but believe and pray that it will be a beginning of something wonderful in our friendship. And uh, not only do we want to have him fill this pulpit, but I want us to be able to be in much prayer. I'm asking everyone, please get one of these cards and cover him and his wonderful family. He left two boys back at home and uh, our daughter that's on the way. Amen. So he comes solo today, but I know there's a family that's waiting for him to get back. And uh, what a beautiful family God has blessed him Amen with, and I believe that God is going to, let me, let's just pray that God would give him the city. Why not? Why not? Church body, will you stretch forth your hands to Brother West right now? Heavenly Father, we pray a special anointing upon this wonderful man and his family. You did not, the Lord, open this door for them just to go and sightsee. But God, they're going to Washington, D.C., God, with a, with a orders from heaven's throne. And I pray, Lord, let him be like a general when he walks, God, down the streets of that city. Let the enemy know that God's man has been appointed. And now, the Lord God occupies the city. Lord, I pray over him and his ministry. I pray over his family. I pray divine favor everywhere he goes. Favor with God and favor with man. In Jesus' mighty name, preach to us. God. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord and give God praise. He is worthy. Man, I feel the presence of the Lord here today. Amen. And I'm so excited about what I feel. Amen. I, I want to just wait on Jesus. What about you? Amen. You know, I, I enjoy those seasons like the children of Israel as they were traveling through the wilderness when they were able to wake up every morning. The Bible says manna was waiting for them. I enjoy those seasons. But eventually, the Bible tells us that He brought the children of Israel to that promised land. And Scripture says they did eat of the old corn of the land. And immediately the Bible says, and the manna ceased. I thank God for those seasons when I can wake up and just gather. Just God's just blessing. It seems like everything's going right. But sometimes God's going to bring us to places where it seems like the manna ceases. And all you can do is wait. You can plant and then wait. Amen. But, but if God is going to allow us to prosper, we've got to learn how to plant and wait. Amen. We've got to come to those seasons where the manna ceases and we just wait on Him because when we wait on Him, we know harvest is coming and God is going to bless and going to keep. Amen. I believe God is with us in 2020. What about you? Amen. And I feel the presence of the Lord here today. And I just want to take a moment and say how much I appreciate the kindness of this church and your wonderful pastor and family. And all the staff here that have made us feel so welcome. And uh, it is so very much appreciated. And what an honor it is to be here. There was a great gift basket waiting on me in my room. And, and, uh, and so I, I disassembled it quickly. And, uh, and by, by the help of the Lord, I'm going to devour that before I leave. Uh, but I, he's going to have to give me some strength because it was quite large. But he has given me quite a large stomach to, to help uh, accomplish it. Amen. I, I am so honored to be here. And, and uh, of course, you can see the picture of my family, my wife, my two boys, Parker and Bennett. And you can't see in that picture. but uh, And it wasn't in that picture. It was sometime after that picture. Now there is one on the way. And, uh, and now we're going to shut the factory down. Uh, regardless of what she has to say about that. And uh, we're excited about that. I apologize that they are unable to be here. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. Here's what I'm going to do. Don't get too comfortable, but I'm going to let you sit down for a second. I'm going to remain standing the entire message, so feel very sorry for me. But you can be seated for a few moments because I'm just going to talk for a second, then we're going to get into the Word of the Lord. And you say, you know, there's a game today. I know there's a game today. Don't you worry. Um, <laughs> So uh, Parker, my six-year-old, was in one of those services that he felt like went a little too long. Anybody ever been in one of those? 
except he was in the Sunday school class. So, you know, in a six-year-old mind, uh, six-year-olds think they're a lot smarter than they are. Um, and so he raised his hand and said to the teacher, my stomach hurts. Like he's the first one to ever try this. He said, my stomach hurts. I think you should go and get my mom and tell her I need to leave. So the teacher was pretty wise. She said, well, Parker, as soon as the lesson is over, I will go and get your mom and you can leave. But what Parker didn't know was as soon as the lesson was over, the teacher was planning to distribute candy. And she did so wisely skipping over Parker because his stomach hurts. So Parker sees uh, what's happening and he raises his hand and he says, well, uh, am I going to get some candy? And she says, well, you know, Parker, if your stomach's hurting, you probably don't need any candy. And without hesitation, he lifted up both of his hands to heaven and said, God just healed me. And uh, so Parker's a liar and he needs the Holy Ghost. Amen. And if he was here today, amen, I feel the Holy Ghost here. He could get the Holy Ghost here. Amen. And so I apologize that they are not with me, but we are uh, traveling as Metro missionaries um, to um, Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. And we hear a lot about Washington, D.C., don't we? Most of it, of course, is pretty negative. It's been called a lot of things, most of those derogatory. And certainly it's a very dark place. It's a place that the enemy has control over. But, you know, just because the enemy controls something does not mean he owns it. A lot of you, you used to allow the enemy to control you, but he never owned you. God owned you. Man, there are a lot of places. This place was a place without a church, but the enemy never owned this community. I mean, the Bible tells us that God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And the only thing that's keeping the enemy in control of some areas and some people and circumstances is the church not taking it back. Amen. So I believe it's the will of God to take our nation's capital back for him. And to turn the lights on. And while it's a place that we have embraced as tourists, if we were to be honest, it's also a place we have neglected as the church. Because I'll, as I'll show you just a quick little picture here, you'll see uh, Washington, D.C. is a pretty small area, just 68 square miles, seven of which is uh, all water. So only the worst of the politicians can survive there. And so then the other 61 square miles is home to over 700,000 people. It's expected to grow to 850,000 people by the year 2030. And yet there's only one English-speaking United Pentecostal church in that area. No wonder it's so dark. Inside the Beltway, that white area you see encircling the District of Columbia, there are 1.8 million people and only two English-speaking United Pentecostal churches. It's been neglected by the church. Amen. But I believe it's the will of God that it be neglected no more. Amen. That apostolic churches would begin to rise up in our nation's capital. And that truth would be proclaimed. So I want to invite you to pray for our nation's capital. I said it in the first hour. Uh, You've heard the mantra, if you don't vote, don't complain. And certainly that's true. If you don't use your voice as a citizen, then, then you don't have much to complain about. But the reality is the church has a greater voice than a vote. They have the voice of prayer. And I challenge you, if you don't pray, don't complain. If you don't pray for our nation, don't complain about our nation. If you don't pray for our president, don't complain about him. I mean, if you don't pray for our our metro cities, then don't complain about what's happening there. But if the church will pray, there is no telling what God will do. Amen. So pray for us. I have a a little video. It's about three minutes long. I'm not going to show it uh, this morning uh, because I want to get right into the word of the Lord. But uh, on your uh, prayer card that you received, go to our Facebook page and watch that video. You'll meet my family and get to hear more about what's happening in Washington, D.C. But God's going to have a church in this last days. Amen. When he said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, there were no boundary exclusions, no areas that were excluded. But whosoever will, I believe God's going to have a church in Washington, D.C. in the last days. Amen. Now, why don't you stand with me so you can experience what I'm going to be experiencing the remainder of this service. Amen. Uh, Thank you again, Pastor, for allowing me to be here. You mentioned that I'm youth president in Kentucky. 
which makes little sense uh, since I'm going to Washington, D.C. So they're kicking me out in a few weeks uh, in March. Um, and uh, I see Brother Danny Smith here. And uh, I mentioned in the Christian Education Hour how much I appreciate the work of the Lighthouse Ranch and being uh, on that General Youth Committee for seven years and hearing uh, all of the stories uh, and as, as he comes in and, and requests money from Shoes for Christ, I probably shouldn't tell him, but he doesn't even have to come. Uh, he doesn't sway us at all. Uh, the General Youth Division and Committee is so behind Lighthouse Ranch. If he never came, we'd still send the money because we believe in what they're doing. and But we do like for him to come so he can tell us about all the bulls and uh, all their luck and, and unluck and all of that good stuff. Amen. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of John, chapter number 4. Man, as pastor opened service this morning, I thought, uh-oh, when he said John 4. Uh, we're going to be really kind of looking at the whole chapter, but just really focusing in on a few verses to start. John, chapter number 4, verse number 3. The Bible says this, He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And verse 4 tells us, And he must needs go through Samaria. And verse 5 tells us, Then cometh he to a city. Somebody say a city. Of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. As Jesus began to head this particular direction, and stop in this city. I believe that the question that must have existed in every disciple's mind. Why are we going this way? And when they stopped in that city. Why are we here in this city? And that's what I, I want to preach to you today. Ask you that question. And by the help of the Holy Ghost answer. Why this city? Amen. God's going to talk to us today. And I believe that God's going to establish your direction for the entire year this morning. I mean, if you want God to speak to you today, would you just lift up your hands to heaven one more time and say, God, I want you to open open my ears to hear. God, to, to hear what you are saying to the church today. God, that, that you would challenge us through your word and that your word would find good soil in every one of our hearts. I thank you for your presence that is here in this place today. God, let your will be done. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I also found out that Louisiana is the home of raising canes. Praise God for raising canes. Amen. Man, when I pulled, got off the exit in Hammond and saw a raising cane sign, I thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And uh, our text this morning finds us only four chapters to the gospel according to John yet within the three chapters that precede this one you will find as you read the story of Jesus' ministry through the pen of John that Jesus' ministry was already well underway before we get to John 4 beginning with the marriage at Cana you can begin to follow the footsteps of our Savior into Capernaum and then, by the time you reach John 2, into Jerusalem, where John says, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. John, in his description of Jesus' earthly ministry, wastes little time before describing to us and revealing to us one of the incredible components of Jesus' ministry on earth, that he was a miracle worker. I got to just tell somebody today, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is a miracle worker. Amen. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or even think God is able to heal today. He's able to touch your body today. He is a miracle worker. Amen. Amen. Reading this account of Jesus' ministry, it makes it so clear. From there, you can read of the story of Jesus' conversation with a man by the name of Nicodemus. A man that was influential in the city, no doubt, who held a position that was high in that area. And he came to Jesus under the cover of darkness. 
You can read there in John 3 of that powerful revelation. When Jesus looked at him and said, You must be born of water and of the Spirit to see the kingdom of God. And then he emphatically declared to all who would read from that moment to this, You must be born again. So many powerful things were happening in the region where Jesus has spent this period of time ministering. We see the miraculous demonstration of God's healing power is causing many to believe. The crowds are swelling. His influence is growing so much so that now he even has this opportunity to preach to one of the influential of the city by the name of Nicodemus. It seems as though if you were one of his disciples in this early part of Jesus' ministry and you witness the influence and the ministry, the miracles, the power of what was happening in that region and now the crowds that were developing because of that, I can imagine you would have thought that Jesus would have never left. Why would you leave when things are going so well, when people are believing, when the influence is, is growing so rapidly? And yet, we begin John chapter number 4. And John tells us in two simple words, in this season where things were going so well, that something began to pull him away. John says, he left. Of course, we read there in John 4 in our text that his eventual destination would be Galilee place that without question made sense for Jesus to journey to. Galilee would be a place that Nazareth, his hometown, would be located. Galilee would be where most of the miracles of Jesus, including his first, would, be tra would transpire. It was in Galilee that he would find Peter and Andrew, James and John. So when Jesus left and said I, that he was going to Galilee, I can't imagine there would have been too many questions as to why or what could have been expected there. But there's more to this story than where he would eventually end up. While we know where he would eventually go, John takes time to mention here in John 4 the route that they would use to get there. In verse 4, John says he must needs go through Samaria. And then, of course, he makes sure to note that they came to a city called Sychar. Now, while Jesus would plainly declare his desire and need to go through Samaria, and while that, in, that journey would inevitably bring them to the city that is mentioned, I have no doubt that the question that must have existed on every disciple's mind as Jesus began to walk that rarely traveled way is, why are we going this way? And as he came to this city, why are we here in this city? Because understand this morning, the route that Jesus chose on this ancient day was not necessary because of road closures. It was not necessary because it was a familiar path. But something else pulled at the heart of Jesus and caused him to go this rarely traveled way. Why this way? When nearly every other Jew would go out of their way to avoid Samaria. And when very few would ever walk by the city that serves as the backdrop for our text today, the words of Jesus echo loudly from those holy pages, I must go through Samaria. Hear me. This way was not a customary way. It would bring them by cities filled with sinners that the Jews couldn't stand. To walk this way would put Jesus out of step with the religious and with the culture of the day. But can I tell you on this first Sunday of 2020, if there's one thing we learn about Jesus in his earthly ministry, it is that situations and places and people that others will go out of their way to avoid, Jesus likes to go that way to confront. What others are quick to dismiss, Jesus is quicker still to embrace. You can ask the leper in Matthew 8, when others will maintain their distance, Jesus, he comes close enough so that he can touch you. You can ask the woman caught in the act of adultery, when others pick up their stones, Jesus will call stones to be dropped and will instead lob mercy in your direction. When others walk past you, 
Jesus walked to you. And when others rejected you and wrote you off, is there anybody in the house today that could testify that Jesus embraced you and brought you near? Oh, hear me. He is unmoved by our culture's opinion of you. He doesn't care what the religious thought about you. But he is willing to walk right in the middle of where you are. Right in the middle of your storm and your mess. He must go through Samaria. You know, a lot of times we look at people and we have a spiritual GPS. I don't know about you, but I have a GPS on my phone. I especially need it, in, you know, in the season that I'm in. You put this GPS on your phone, then you don't have to listen to your wife tell you which way to go. You can even change the voice to a man, then you don't ever have to listen to a woman. I'm just kidding. Calm down. Calm down. The ladies are going to run me out of this place. <laughs> One of the best things about a GPS, though, is you can avoid things. You can avoid traffic. You can avoid tolls. I'll give you a little clue. There are some apps that will alert you if there's an officer of the law within a half a mile. You can avoid tickets. That, my wife needs that. I don't need that. I, I always drive the speed limit if there's any officers of the law in the place. But the reality is we have a spiritual GPS built into us, and we too use it to avoid things. We like to avoid brokenness. We like to avoid hurt. We like to avoid people with a past because we forget that such were some of you. I just want to remind somebody in this house today, the place Jesus found you was a broken place. The place he met you at, it was a hopeless place. He had to fight through some things in order to get to you and in order to get to me. But thanks be to God, whatever he has to fight through, he will do it. Uh, whatever he has to go through, he is willing to do it. Amen. He had to go through Samaria to get to you. You say, well, I didn't live in Samaria. Oh, you have a Samaria. We all have a Samaria. Broken places. Places that are filled with compromise and hurt and neglect and rejection. Oh, we have places just like that. We have storms. We have trials. Things that we wanted to avoid but couldn't avoid. And we find ourselves in them. And yet Jesus says through the pages of Scripture, and I believe through the Spirit today, I must go through Samaria. I've come to preach to somebody for a few moments right now. You feel like you're in a Samaria. You feel broken and hurt and lost and hurt. I got to tell you, Jesus is in this place today. And he's come looking for you. Hey Amen. He's able to find you wherever you are. But again, the question still remains, why did he go this way? Why did he come to this city? And most imagine, I suppose, that his purpose is found in the next few verses, John says in verse 6 that Jesus pauses at his journey at Jacob's well. The disciples use this as an opportunity to go and get some food. My kind of guys. And while they are away, the Bible lets us know that as Jesus is resting at the well, a woman from the city comes to draw water. It's interesting to me some of the details that God chooses to allow in Scripture. This story is no different. We're told she's alone. We're told why she's coming to draw water. We're told what's in her hand, a water pot. So many details. And Jesus meets this woman there. And interestingly, we're told the time of the day. Every detail important. The timing, of course, is important because it wasn't the customary time to go to the well women of the city would have gone in the morning yet here she is by herself in the middle of the evening she's pretty dismissive of Jesus Jesus offers her some water she dismisses that as well until he says 
that if she would drink of that water, she would never thirst again. And suddenly, she's interested. She says, give me this water that I thirst not. And that's all we read oftentimes. But that's not all she said. Because then she also said, neither come hither to draw. It was as though for this woman the benefit was greater than that promised lack of thirst because she also said, I don't want to have to come to this well anymore. And I don't know what that well represented for her or what conversations must have spurred her distaste for going to the well or what it was necessarily that pushed her to go to the well at the odd times of the day to avoid the crowd. But whatever it was, she was tired of it. She knew she needed something to handle the thirst. That's why she was there. But she had reached a place in her life where she detested the well so much that she was willing to try something else that would keep her from having to go back there day after day after day. It was as though her prayer could have been something like this. I know I need something in my life. That's why I'm at this old well. But I'm tired of trying what I've been trying. Can I just remind somebody here on this Sunday morning that sometimes before God can give you what you really need, you first have to get tired of those things that don't satisfy the need. You got to get tired of that constant journey for just enough, just enough joy, just enough peace, just enough happiness. Because what Jesus offers you is greater than just enough. He says, I have rivers of living water. But you've got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Before you can get it, you've got to get tired of trying what you were trying before. Too many people. They come to God. They want Jesus and the well. Jesus and the world. Jesus and the relationships. Jesus and the drugs. Jesus and, and you fill in the blank for whatever it is. But this woman had reached a place where she realized that that well never satisfied her in the first place. Hear me. The only way that God can truly satisfy you and fill you is when you first realize that nothing else can satisfy you like Him. I've searched the whole world over, and I can't find nobody like him. you got to say, I want Jesus only. But here's what we do if we're being honest. We treat Jesus like Saul treated David. Saul had a problem. He thought it was a temporary problem. He was tormented by spirits. So he discovered that he could bring David in and David would play for him and he would get temporary relief and that was good enough he was willing to give David the floor but he never intended to give David the throne and if we were to be honest sometimes we've had seasons in our lives where we've treated our troubles as temporary and we come to the house of God looking for a temporary fix or solution and we give God the floor in our lives. We say, God, I need you to move for me. I need you to work for me. But you've not surrendered the throne in your life. And you wonder why you leave and the problem comes back and the trouble resurfaces. And the, and the, and the situation doesn't seem to get any better. It's because you've given God the floor on a Sunday morning. But you've never given him the throne in your life. But you cannot have God's kingdom and keep your own throne. But this woman... She says, I surrender all. I'm willing. Give me this water, and I'll give up this well. But I want you to know what Jesus does in this moment where she's ready to completely surrender. Seeing perhaps what she will face when she goes back to that city and begins to share of her experience. Jesus says to her, go and call your husband course she doesn't have a husband if you've read the story it's no secret to you but this is a woman who had had a few of them five to be exact Jesus wanted to reveal something greater than her need he says go and get your husband uncovering the greatest hurt in her life she says I have no husband it's interesting because that's all she says <laughs> 
And he says, oh, I know. You've had five. And the one you're with now is not your husband. And probably in this moment is the first time that she's thankful she's at the well all alone. <laughs> it's kind of like you've been in one of those services where somebody just starts operating in the gift of knowledge. It seems like and they're reading somebody's mail. And suddenly you start repenting of things. You're like, God, help me. I'm not, I, and you try not to make eye contact with that guy because you don't want him reading your mail in front of everybody. And you're like, Lord, forgive me uh, for what I did 35 years ago. I, I, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm going to serve you. Don't worry, I'm not one of those. I can't even read my wife's mind. It's interesting. For all the details that were included in the story, we don't know what happened to the husbands. The gossip in me would like to know. What happened to your old husbands? Maybe I'll ask her when I get to heaven. Maybe they left her a story perhaps they died that would be interesting and would explain why number six said hey I'll live with you but I'm not marrying you <laughs> there's five tombstones that tell me I should not marry you you're a good cook you're a beautiful woman I'll live with you that's all <laughs> but for all the minute details that are included in the story the reason for the lost husbands is not included. Why? Because what brought you your past isn't what's important. What was important to Jesus wasn't the fact that she had five lost husbands. But instead he was revealing to her not to condemn her, but to reveal to her that his knowledge of her past didn't stop him from the journey. He said, I know everything about you already, and yet here I am in front of you today. I just want to remind somebody today, God knows you. He knows everything about you. He's seen every sin. He knows every mistake. He's seen every fear, every doubt, every tear that's, that's brought its way down your wrinkled face. He knows you. And yet despite the fact that He knows us, He loves us anyway. Despite the fact that he knows me, he's here for me anyway. He died for me anyway. He cares for me anyway. What a revelation. Because I've got to tell you, and I, and I need to hurry. I've met some people and got to know them. And I liked them a whole lot better before I knew them. Now, don't look around. That would be a dangerous time. Be like, yeah, that's why I sit on the opposite side of this church than that person we were better as Facebook friends. We should go back to that. But Jesus, He knows you. You're not hiding anything from Him. Everybody else may think everything's all right, but He knows you. He knows you. He saw the thoughts that you were thinking before you came here today. He, he heard the arguments you had with your wife before you got here this morning. He saw what you were looking at on the internet yesterday. He knows you. And yet despite the fact that he knows everything about me, every ugly, every terrible thing about me, he loved me anyway. He said, I know you. So much could be said about that. The Bible tells us that he looks at this woman and in the midst of this conversation, this woman who was broken, who had been rejected, who had been married five times, who went to the well at the wrong time of the day in a place that was out of the way. Everything was off about this story. And yet it's the very first time in the book of John that Jesus ever looks at somebody and he says, I am the Messiah. Very first time. Somebody broken and hurt and lost and disappointed and rejected. He says, I am your Messiah, can I just remind somebody on this Sunday morning, He wants to be your Messiah. Hey Amen. I know you don't have anything to offer Him, but He loves you anyway. He wants to be your Messiah. I know that you've been broken and hurt and disappointed by others, and maybe even religion and churches have hurt you, but He wants to be your Messiah. He wants to reveal Himself as Messiah to you. This is what I've really come to preach, and I'm going to do it in just a few minutes. While I've heard it preached, Jesus made this journey for this woman. And perhaps I've even preached that the journey was for her. I think we missed the purpose of Jesus' visit that day and to that woman when we make it about one person. Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe Jesus will leave 99 to find one, and he's interested even when it's just one. But Jesus gives us some words a little later in this chapter that reveals why this way and why this city. 
Bible says that when this woman gets this revelation, when she sees clearly who she's talking to, when she gets 20-20 vision, the Bible says she immediately puts her water pot down and she begins to run through the city with a testimony on her lips saying, Come and see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? She had this encounter that changed her life in such a way that she could be silent no more, that she could reject the crowd no more, so that she could hide no more. And I want you to know what happened. Verse 39 tells us, Many believed on him for the saying of the woman. John uses that same Greek word that he used in chapter 2 to describe that supernatural demonstration and the result of that, that many believed in him when they saw the miracles that he did. That same Greek word is the word that John ascribes to the results of this singular woman's testimony. Many believed because of the saying of the woman. And this is what I believe. I believe that we elevate supernatural demonstration. And rightfully so. We want to see God work. And we want to see signs, miracles, and wonders. And I believe that God wants to do that like never before in our day and age. So don't think that I'm discounting that. But I'm afraid that we elevate that sometimes. And yet we minimize what God has already done in our lives. Because the greatest thing God could ever do in your life is not heal your body. The greatest thing He could do, He has already done when He revealed Himself as your Messiah. You sit there all silent and quiet, never telling anybody about Him because you're waiting for Him to do something to tell about. But God has already found you. God already saved you. He already revealed Himself to you. And you've got to tell somebody about it. There is no telling what God would do in this church if somebody would understand and get a testimony on their lips. Yes, he went there to meet her. and He knew that meeting her would change that city as she began to go and share what, what God had done. The Bible says many believed because of her testimony. He knew that armed with the testimony, she would go back into that city and she would begin to bring others to him. This is what I'm preaching to this church today. Why is this church in this city? I'm not preaching about Washington, D.C. I'm preaching about your area. And we begin to think it's just for me. And it is for me, but it's not just for me. God gave me a testimony so that I would begin to share it. And some would believe. But here's our problem. This is going to hurt. I hope I get invited back. Our problem is we love living at the well. That place where God filled us up, where He touched us. And I thank God. Sometimes you got to go back to the well. You got to get refilled. All that stuff needs to happen. If you've not been refilled in a long time, you need to get refilled, okay? But our life song sometimes becomes this Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. And I want him to fill it up, but if all you ever do is have your cup up in the air, want him to fill it up again. Sometimes you got to put the water pot down, and you got to leave the church house, and you got to tell somebody else about what God has already done. We have become gluttonous on the presence and power of God, while others are starving to know what we know. Hear me, God has been too good to me to be silent. It's time for the church to rise up with a testimony on our lips. He's done so much for me, the song said. I cannot tell it all. You know what? Just try telling some of it. You don't have to tell it all. But you can tell some of it. This woman, she got out of her comfort zone and begin to face the people who had hurt her and who had rejected her and who had talked about her and she started saying come and see a man and as crazy as that might have sounded coming from this woman who had had five other husbands in the past she knew that God had done too much for her to be silent so she pushed beyond the shame and the and the sadness and the hurt and she got out of her comfort zone because hear me you cannot fulfill your calling while living in your comfort zone you say well I'm just shy that's who I am I can't tell anybody about him Hear me, get out of your comfort zone and start telling somebody about him. You say, well, I don't have it all figured out doctrinally. Neither did she. She didn't wait till she had it all figured out doctrinally. She just began to tell somebody about it. But here's, here's what happened. I want you to see what happened. While she's away, 
And I'm coming to a close right now. While she's away, maybe the music could come just to remind me that I said I'm coming to a close. I'm just preaching longer in case you get paid overtime around here. The Bible says she's away. She's sharing her testimony. And the disciples, of course, they're back now with their bellies filled. And they're wondering what's happening. And Jesus takes this moment to try to adjust their vision a little bit. And we disconnect this story from this chapter, but it's right in the middle of John chapter 4. But Jesus looks at his disciples and says this, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already in harvest. He said, you thought you were here for food. You thought you were here for yourself. But but I brought you here for harvest. I brought you here for something so much greater. And while Jesus is saying those words, I have no doubt that people from the city are beginning to come that way. And when Jesus said he saw fields, he was seeing faces. And he was seeing families of people who had been impacted not by his miracles, but by a woman's testimony. Many begin to come. And many believe preach to you that's why he came this way that's why he's here in this city and while this church has experienced tremendous revival it's not the will of God that you get comfortable and complacent oh there's a greater harvest here there's a greater revival here and we sit around and we wait for pastor to bring it but revival's in you revival's in you Revival's in a young person at school. Revival is in somebody in the workplace. Revival is in you. We do it because there's harvest here. Stand with me. We have two choices this morning. We can be like this woman, so moved by what Jesus had done. We have to run throughout the city and share our testimony. Or we can be like the disciples who heard Jesus describe his desire to go that way and yet miss the purpose altogether. They thought it was for food. They walked past this woman and they walked past this harvest because they were led by their stomachs and not by their hearts. They were looking for something to fill themselves when God had sent them there to fill others. A few months ago, I was in Virginia, and uh, I was driving up toward Washington, D.C., actually, to a church just outside of the city that I was going to be speaking at that Sunday morning. And so we stopped at a Cracker Barrel. I had my kids with me. And if you haven't told your kids no in a while, take them to the Cracker Barrel Country Store. You'll get a good practice. Uh, I don't know who invented the country store, but I hope they have bed bugs. I'm only partially joking there. So uh, I'm waiting for a table. And this guy walks up to me, older gentleman. And I just so happen I, I'm wearing an Indiana Bible College t-shirt. It's where I went to school. And, uh, and so he walks up to me and said, is that Indiana Bible College? I said, yes, sir. He said, did you go there? I said, yes, sir. He said, oh, okay. He said, I used to be Pentecostal. I said, okay. I still am. He said, uh, you want to know my problem with the church? I said, well, my table's not ready yet. Go ahead. He said, I was attending a church. And they started reading from a translation that wasn't the King James when the preacher was preaching. And I said, I am not going to attend a church that reads anything but the KJV. So I said, well, okay, let me get this straight. You decided to quit going to church entirely. And you decided to be lost instead of going to a church that did something that you didn't like. You didn't try to find another church. You didn't try to talk to the pastor. You just left. He said, well, yeah, that's basically what I did. I said, that's not the will of God. And I began to talk to him. Tears began to stream down his face. Well, as the conversation went on, 
he revealed to me that the Virginia District Campground was only about 30 minutes away from there. I said, well, that's a coincidence because I'm preaching there next week. I said, you should come and be my guest. He said, well, I might do that. So he waits. He, I, I, I'm there all week, Monday through Friday for the youth camp. Finally, Friday night, Ron shows up. Now, if you had not been in church in a while, I don't advise Friday night at a youth camp be your first time to go back. Because by then, those kids are, you know, they're like, they're wild, okay? They need their parents to come pick them up. <laughs> but you know what, what happened? Before, well, I'll tell you, the first thing that happened, I looked through my notes to make sure it wasn't nothing but the good old KJV. <laughs> then the second thing that happened, the altar call, old Ron made his way down to the altar and lifted up his hands to heaven and began to reach out to God. See, I thought I was at that cracker barrel to fill myself, but God had me there on a divine assignment to meet Ron Swank. Hear me. God has you here for a reason. God has you on your job for a reason. God has you in your high school for a reason. And it doesn't have your name on it. It has somebody else's name on it. God has you in this church here on a divine assignment to impact the kingdom, to disrupt the kingdom of darkness, and to establish the kingdom of God. But it's going to require somebody saying, use me. Why this city? It's for, for me to share with somebody else. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know I've went a little long, and I apologize, but I feel the presence of the Lord here right now. I'm reaching for two types of people right now. I'm first reaching for somebody. You kind of feel like you're at a well that hasn't satisfied you. You've been involved in things, and you've searched, and you've looked, and you, find, you found yourself here this morning. And maybe you've tried Jesus before, but you've been trying Jesus and other things. I want to tell you the Holy Ghost is here today. God wants to meet you here. God wants to fill you with His Spirit. He wants to give you those living waters. That He wants to wash over you with grace and with mercy. And the enemy says you've messed up too much and gone too far. But God's grace and mercy is here today. And He's here for you. And He's come to meet you and to touch you and to feel you. But also, I'm reaching for the church family today that you would say you're so full of God's presence and God's goodness that you could just burst. And I've come to challenge you in the Holy Ghost today. It's time to start using your mouth to share what God has done. God wants to use you in this end time revival. and He wants to use your testimony. So I wonder if anybody in this house would begin to make your way to this altar just as a sign of commitment on this first Sunday of 2020 and say, God, give me fresh vision for harvest. Help me to see my coworkers as a part of your harvest. Help me, God, to be a part of what you're desiring to do. I want you to use me. I want you to touch me. I want you to, to impact my, my mouth and give me the words to say. Come on, if that's you, or if you need God to touch you and do something special in your life today, would you step out of where you are and come around this altar and say, God, God, I believe you're here for me today, and I believe that you've come to touch me and give me a testimony today. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here right now. Would you begin to reach up to Him? Come on, even right where you're standing, you can begin to surrender to Him. God can begin to wash over you. Oh, I need you, Jesus. God, come on, why don't you pray for some lost loved one right now? Why don't you pray for your lost neighbor and coworker right now? Call their names. God, help me to make a difference. Help me to be a part of this revival. God, help me to get my eyes back on the harvest, back on the field, back on what you desire to do in this day and hour.